Hello and welcome to Kill Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are here in the studio in northern Colorado. Yes, uh, we are still uh, in the uh, isolation mode of COVID. Uh, for those of you watching on video, I uh, yes, I am wearing my Chicago White Sox hat. Um, yes, I did grow up in Chicago, by the way. A number of you sent me emails asking about the significance of the hat. I did grow up 185th South in Halstead on the far south side. So I have to obviously be a, uh, a Chicago White Sox fan. Um, as we've continued on with the, the show, as you know, we're in season 16. And we are always on the look for great guests. So if you have a guest that you think would be a good one to hear about or have on the show, drop me a note, phil at killerinnovations.com. Would love to uh, hear. Uh, this week, we do have a guest. As you know, the last couple of weeks, I did a series on out-of-the-box thinking. Um, got really strong response. Thank you for all that feedback. Uh, this week, we're bringing a guest who actually not only started off on the side of product development and innovation, but now actually helps companies and a wide range of companies, including my alma mater at, uh, at HP, on how to speed up the process of innovation. How do you make it go faster? And how do you think differently about the overall process? So with that, let me bring on our guest today. Our guest is John Carter. John, thanks for joining us here at Kill Innovations. Well, thanks. I'm delighted to be here. I've been a fan of your show, and, and you pr produce some really interesting content. So it's a tall bar I need to, <laughs> to stand up to here. <laughs> well, as I tell all the guests when they come on the show, right, for those of us that are that are in this, what I call the innovation game, it's just a conversation, right? Because we could all sit here and Oh, both share, you know, share our nightmares, but also share, you know, share the big wins. So in your case, introduce yourself to, to the audience here. Give us a little bit of background about you. Sure. Well, um, and thanks for asking, because I think background's critically important. Uh, I'm a big believer in your first job in your career is probably the most important. Uh, that for me was basically where I started as a child. I was always kind of a boy scientist locked in the room. I had an advanced chemistry set <laughs> and certainly found out how things were combined and, and uh, combusted in exciting ways. I enjoyed that, and I also got an amateur radio license when I was in high school. So I've always been interested in, in those sorts of things. My father went to Caltech. He was a mechanical engineer and was a great inspiration for me. He never forgot, for example, what the value was of E or pi to many decimal places. <laughs> so I had wonderful upbringing. I um, studied engineering as an undergraduate in one of the best possible ways. I went to Harvey Mudd as an undergrad, and there we learned about systems engineering. So there are only four majors at, at Harvey Mudd when I was there, and one of them was engineering, and I took it. But uh, being a generalist, I think, is really important in this whole notion that uh, there's a, a T-based intellect where you've got breadth as well as depth, uh, I think, served us all well. And this served me very well in my work with Dr. Bose because he always approached things as systems. And it's really important because if you're innovating, you can always achieve, in my opinion, more profound innovations by looking at the system rather than component parts. Okay, so real quick, define what you mean when you say look, view it as a system. It's a really great question. I think in the case of, of audio, where we were, were, were from, it was combining the speaker and the electronics. Or for the headphones, not only that, but adding a microphone to provide feedback. And then the work that Bose did in car suspensions, it wasn't just tires or shock absorbers. It was a whole, as we call it, a closed loop system, which means that you compare the input to the output and you, you adjust it if there's a difference. And so that's what we mean by uh, a, a system. It'd be a collection of components that lead to consumer value in the most general senses. Um, it, it, anyway, I studied engineering, loved that as a field, uh, wanted to really learn about sound. I was very, very curious about uh, music, sound, and how it was created, physical 
acoustics, how sound uh, propagated, vibrated, and so forth. Uh, and so I wanted to study that. I, I applied for uh, at three schools and uh, got f uh, financial aid from none of them. <laughs> but I went to MIT and I drove cross country with all my stereo equipment and records at the time. And and I had this amazing experience, Phil, that I think was absolutely seminal in my background, which is that I was taking the acoustics course as a grad student, but I'd never taken it before. And as I had mentioned there, TA, teaching assistant, dropped out at the last minute. And so Dr. Bose asked if there was anyone on the class that wanted to be a TA. I raised my hand and uh, he interviewed me and he really made a snap decision that I would be okay. It was the roughest uh, semester of my life. Though. It was, there are some smart people there. <laughs> and I certainly learned what uh, being below average is, is like uh, for sure. But it was a great experience. I had the fortune that Dr. Bose was my thesis advisor so I did a master's thesis, worked there, worked there in summers, and then joined the company as a researcher. And there started uh, uh, developing um, the technology that led to the noise-canceling headphones. I was promoted to chief engineer and then both managed projects and programs as well as innovation. After Bose, I created a, a consulting firm in helping companies get a faster time to market and helped Apple develop their Apple new product process, work with uh, Phil, your alma mater in many places and end over at the medical division and in and, and Cupertino at the headquarters and, and with offspring like Agilent here in San Jose. So I've, I've had a good breadth and I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, I've also done work in private equity and raised some capital to do a roll up and so sometimes I wear kind of a more um, strategic financial hat, but most of the time I love products and helping companies innovate products faster, which is kind of, if you will, a nutshell of what we do and, and my current focus. So what, how, what year did you join? How long were you at Bose? I was uh, there nearly 15 years. Okay. I uh, basically joined uh, essentially a year before my thesis because I worked part-time there and then joined full-time uh, and was in research for about five years and then ran all of R&D uh, for about 10. Interesting, because you and I were talking before we started uh, today's show because, uh, you know, the Bose is an interesting topic, you know. For the you listening to the show, you've heard me talk about my experience at meeting with Dr. Bose and then Dr. Bose's son, Vanu Bose, who also was a Dr. Bose. So, you know, it's, That's right. it's kind of a, <laughs> he had a PhD you know, from MIT too. It's, right. it's just a proof point that DNA does have a play in here somewhere. Yeah, I think it does matter. <laughs> when, you, when you see <laughs> Vanu and his dad and they're standing next and you go, holy smokes. You know, they each could lose 20 IQ points and still leave me in, you know, leave me in the dust. You know? <laughs> incredibly, incredibly smart. But, um, you know, the, 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 the you know, Bose is, is an interesting topic if, just from the standpoint of just the, the, the level of innovation. And, but also, as you and I were talking before we started, um, the show is about patience, you know, the willingness of an organization to make the long bet um, in the innovation game, uh, they're few and far between. Um, and I can give some examples of Bill Hill and David Packard on the original risk processors, you know, um, uh, you know, with precision architecture processors that went for 15 years before it ever you could commercialize it. But the same thing, you know, with, with Bose, you look at, you know, what, how many years was it for the noise canceling headphones from seven years, seven years, seven years, not many organizations <laughs> will, will, will make that kind of a bet, you know, for the long play like that. And, uh, it's always something that I've always admired about Bose and, and the team that's there. Yeah, he would he would make these long bets, Phil, and he would actually nurture them and and make sure that they were on the right course. It it was the way he derived pleasure out of work because he loved being in the lab and working with engineering teams, and he absolutely left finance and operations and all other functions to the president. Yeah, but he well, it, he 
he chose what he wanted to work on. Well, and, that, and that's actually a sign of a great innovation leader, to know what do you really enjoy and what is it you're really good at, because that has, that has an impact. You know, if you, if you feel like you got to do it because you're the CEO, look, I'm the CEO at, at Cable Labs. There's part of the organization I just don't even bother to stick my nose in because I don't enjoy it. And, and therefore, if I don't enjoy it, I'm not going to be as good at it. I'm not going to be as committed to it. But with Dr. Bose, you knew where he stood and he hired really good people to do the things that he wasn't very good at. John, in the last segment, we were talking about Bose and the fact that they have this, they're just the best example out there for patience. When they, when you've got to work on something and you're, you're committed to a program, you know that you're going to have that support. People are willing, when it makes sense, willing to make that investment. Give us the context of that around the noise canceling headphones. Cause you said that was eight years. That's a long time to be working on, uh, on a single program to try to bring something as transformative, as disruptive as the Bose, the Bose noise-canceling headphones. Yeah, well, it's a good story. And, and frankly, I think it could have been done faster. And we had some stumbling blocks that we should have avoided <laughs> and not, <laughs> not investigated and oh, solved. Uh, you mean it wasn't uh, perfect? <laughs> no, it wasn't. And we'll, we'll get to some of those issues here where, in fact, we had uh, we had our challenges. Uh, working with Dr. Bose was amazing. He, uh, as you and I chatted, was someone that was amazingly focused. And he did two things. He focused on engineering and marketing. Mm -hmm. And those two things alone, and engineering probably 70%, marketing 30%, he was very, very much an inventor himself. When I started at Bose, uh, we uh, talked about two programs to work on in parallel. One had to do with this idea about headphones. Could you put a microphone inside it and somehow uh, improve or reduce its imperfections? The other project was about a loudspeaker, and could you make a design that would ensure that the loudspeaker sounded uh, great no matter where you placed it? I was working on those two projects in parallel for a couple months. This is a really important uh, uh, lesson right away, and I think you talked about this just a few shows ago when you're talking about how true innovation takes place among smaller groups. Uh, this innovation was myself and Dr. Bose and the technician. That was it. There are three people working <laughs> on this, totally focused to it. And you talk about patience. Well, patient goes along with focus. And that's part of what you teach organizations is the importance of focus in innovation. Uh, we were working on two programs. And within about a couple of months, I said, Dr. Bose, you know, we're making great progress on the, on the headphones and we're really having challenges. And he said, well, let's just let's drop the other one. And most companies would hedge their bets. They'd right. work on both, and both would be starved for resources. Or you say, throw, or they throw bodies at it, which doesn't uh, help in some it, cases. It, it, it actually, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, it, invention is not something that is really helped by a large number of people. Right. Execution is, and I yes. think you'd agree with that. Yep. Uh, but invention is a small team activity. Uh, so we got started. We had this notion that was a little bit like a, a cocktail napkin uh, sketch, very schematic. And one of the interesting stumble, uh, stumbling blocks, and I think you'll find this um, uh, interesting to your listeners, is that when we first created this idea, we created it with the whole concept that this would be a better sounding headset, which it is, or headphone. So the focus was on improving bass response making it uniform, whether you're wearing glasses or not, and also uh, making the bass as pronounced as you could be to really reproduce music So and, and reduce distortion. So it was all about these kind of techie features about the headphones. Only late, after we shared this with customers, did we find out it's noise reduction, stupid. It's not all these <laughs> other things. Well, this gets back to wrong. This gets back to the whole issue is, is sometimes you got to be careful because you're not the proxy for the customer, right? And uh, it, you're the inventor. You would think <laughs> that you would absolutely know how the product would be used, appreciated, and its benefits. I, we were totally wrong. Yeah. Totally wrong. 
Uh, <laughs> and that cost us. So I mentioned about the fact that we were we took so long. One of the things that we did, and this is another foible I'm sure many guests have talked about, is we made perfection the enemy of the good. So we worked for years trying to eke out the last decibel of, of improvement in frequency response or a percentage in distortion when, in fact, all people cared about was noise reduction. So we were optimizing the wrong thing, and we were working way, way too far out on, ter- on the curve in terms of better performance, you know, where you have to put an enormous effort even to make it a little bit better. So a couple of stumbling blocks. First, we didn't understand what the true <laughs> benefits were, and that's a killer. And the second was that we really – way over engineered the thing and i think you know hindsight those are two things that we could have really done better well even in my own background right this gets back to you know the printing business right at hp you know the big fight was always for dots per inch you know the old bubble jets at 300 and 1200 and 2400 and 4800 pretty soon you were beyond perception of the human eye so you're out here engineering way out on the edge of the curve when the customer's like, oh, 1,200 DPI looks good to me, you know. Is that the case here also then? I mean, what percentage of the customers could even hear the, the difference, you know, of that, of that last 1%? Perfect example. Perfect example. Now, I'd say one thing that Bose was much better than its competitors is they did not get into what I call the checkbox marketing game, where it's all about numbers of features or all about a percentage of improvement that, in fact, was not appreciable by the eye or by the ear. And the, the, it's, it's crazy, but I think often the lowest common denominator in marketing is to really go down that path, especially when it's beyond the limits of human perception. Yeah, I mean, and, You can't and it, Im- imagine that uh, well, as a waste. It's, but sometimes it's, you know, yeah, again, though, right? It gets back to you think you know the customer, right? You think you know what the customer is going to buy, what, that, what the criteria and how you're going to differentiate against you know, others that are, that are in the field or whatever. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, as I, as I jokingly have said many a time, you know, there comes a time in life of a product where you shoot the engineer and ship it. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly right. Right. You know, Phil, today I'm on the board of Cirrus Logic, which makes semiconductor chips in the audio arena. And many of our customers want uh, 24 bits of precision and bandwidths that are way beyond the hearing limits <laughs> of humans. And the company is good and faithfully delivers on that, but no one really asks the deep and fundamental question, can you hear the difference and right. does it matter? And so I think the an analogy of shooting the engineer absolutely applied here. Well, and I think, you know, I, I think it's applied to you know, both of our careers over – you know, over time, sometimes, right? You, sometimes you guys got to get people to let go and put it out there, right? You know, because again, exactly. if you wait, I, I loved your analogy on that, you know, perfection is, you know, w- when's it good enough and where do you let, you know, perfection? So, John, we were talking coming out of that last segment about the headphones and eight years and <laughs> and we were laughing about the fact you know what mean the process isn't perfect you know <laughs> you know patience is required but we talk about innovation in that in a product context but what has always impressed me about the noise canceling headphones was is that but it also required for Bose to innovate on how to bring that product to market because a $300 you know, noise canceling headphones was so new and radical to the market. How do you sell something like that? And therefore, you found yourself having to innovate that. So, talk about how that all came about. Uh, really great question. I'm glad you asked because it's, uh, I think, a common misperception that uh, innovation only is done at the product level or technical level. That's absolutely not the case. And I would say that some of the greatest innovations at Bose was on the marketing and sales uh, front. First of all, and I think this is important, we had a very good North Star. And that was 
very simple product vision statements like better implies different and not the other way around or great sound from small packages. So we had very, very simple um, elements, guiding principles that we use to help us really work on our innovations and judge what was good. Well, if, if you look at what was done in the headphones, uh, what you described to the audience was uh, exactly true in terms of the, the challenge that we confronted when trying to bring that to market. And so Dr. Bosa turns out, not many people know this, he had a retail laboratory store in Honolulu, Hawaii. And he had this a decade before he he went out broadly with retail. And he used that as a studio to experiment. So he was quietly doing uh, retail and marketing experiments while we were developing this new technology in the lab. Very low key, but very important because, as you stated, at the time, there was no such thing as a $300 headphone. How could you possibly sell something like this? Bose was one of those great innovators who could innovate on two dimensions at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think Dyson is that way and, and Jobs is that way. There are a couple of really great innovators who actually conceptualize how innovation can take different forms. And Dr. Bose was such a profound thinker about this. If the distribution channel fit wasn't right, he would invent distribution to solve the product, not try and force it through a channel where it would never be successful. And the issue with many uh, Bose products, we talked about this in the prior segment, is they don't compete on this checkbox marketing kind of this spec versus that spec, they really focus on demonstrable benefits. You can hear it in your ears, and it's obvious what the benefit is. Well, it turns out in retail, whether it's the Bose's Wave Radio or the headphones, you can't experience the, the benefit unless you try it. Right. Well, in the fast retail environment, there's no time for that. And therefore, salesmen are looking for the quick sale rather than educating customers. That's the way this uh, fast-moving consumer channel is, as, as you know very well with your printer experience, direct uh, experience. <laughs> uh, so what do you do about that? You have a product that is outpriced by in, any other, any meaningful metric by maybe a factor of 10, but yet at the, at the same time you know its benefits. If people were to hear it, they would love to have it. So what he did is he went through this process of successive refinement and mistakes, costly mistakes. <laughs> so the first thing he tried, believe it or not, was door to door. <laughs> he was trying to sell Bose product door to door. He even got uh, the chairman of Electrolux, um, a door to door marketer of vacuum cleaners at the time, to, to advise us on this, uh, this so-called direct strategy. Well, we tried that, it failed. Then we went to direct mail, thinking that that would work, you know, uh, putting in coupons in the Wall Street Journal and so forth. And that really sputtered out and didn't deliver. And finally, what they did is they actually went with Paul Harvey. And Paul had this AM radio uh, station that was syndicated all around the United States. And he would do if you will, kind of spots on various products. Turns out this was it. And that allowed us really to develop a fan base of dedicated uh, users of our technology, which then told friends and family, and that's how you, how you go. But one of the things we learned early on from, from Dr. Bose, Phil, is, is this notion of how important third-party credibility is. Mm -hmm. You can never toot your own horn. But having someone else, especially who is an authority, talk about you in glowing terms is the way to go. And in the early days, we cultivated the Hi-Fi Press, the reviewers. But then we moved to Paul Harvey, and we found that is a terrific way to communicate directly to consumers. Of course, we then had mail fulfillment and all the other things around it. But uh, uh, back to your question about or observation around focus. Can you imagine this kind of focus? First, to have a retail laboratory in Hawaii for 10 years. Then to try all of these expensive uh, 
uh, marketing experiments only to fail. And then finally he found the right mechanism which would get enough users so that you would then get the most powerful form of endorsement, which is word of mouth. So well, he was an amazing innovator when it came to marketing. Well, and this gets this points to another issue. You know, <laughs> Dr. Bose was was innovating the use of influencers, right? We think about influencers being kind of a modern thing with social media. Not the case, right? But the other thing that's amazing is is that willingness to experiment, fail, and try again. The fat experiment didn't work. Okay, going door to door, eh, then didn't quite pan out. Let's do, you know, direct advertising, right? No, that didn't work out. Keep trying. A lot of organizations, they try maybe one or two, and then they say, oh, it must be something with the product. You can kill it. We're not going to go with it and, and you know, go and, and, dump the whole, and dump the whole project, right? Versus, nope, that didn't work. Let's try this. This works better. Or we're kind of close. Let's try this. Do a little, a little spin on it. And I think that just is another... Uh, another proof point that all innovators need to understand that failure is not the negative. Failure is education. And as you become more educated, you can make better decisions on what will work and what will not work. But it's about lopping off, you know, dead alleys. You know, you oh, you try that, cut that alley off. Let's go a different direction. Hope that doesn't work out. Let's go a different direction. But you gotta you gotta be willing to slog through it because if you're truly pushing the envelope. You, this will, uh, you're never going to quite, uh, you're going to, you're going to, you may fall short just before the thing takes off. I got a question for you though on the noise canceling. Bose also did, does headphones or did headphones, I think they still do, for airline pilots. So if you've got, now did those come before the noise canceling or did noise canceling influence those? Because those are also noise canceling, right? The, the, but they, exactly they are. So th this is a really interesting story about the, uh, origin and early years of development of that technology. So one thing that Bose was really keen on, and I think there's a diabolically positive uh, element of this, is he would go after research contracts with the government, with mm. the military. Uh, and he would use them to help fund this innovation along so all the uh, energy would not come from the Bose pocketbook, but would be shared by those who would interestingly want to apply it. And I, and I can never uh, forget the first meeting that I had uh, carrying all this test equipment out in this huge, these huge suitcases to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, because <laughs> in lovely Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> it's exactly right. Exactly. It's a huge campus. Oh. And we, we had a demonstration that went very, very well. And then it be really began to dawn on us that. Noise canceling is important, and in fact, aviation might be really important. So uh, one thing that happened was pretty funny. About a week after I was there, I got a call from the executive or the manager who r run the, the labs in this area, and he said, I don't see a proposal. Are you going to write one? And it's like, oh, yeah, I have to do that part too. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little bit of basics that uh, you have to, you have to learn about. You gotta, you gotta learn about that. And I think, I think a lot of people overlook about either, you know, what I sometimes refer to as co-innovation or, uh, that you can do work with government, not just, you know, it's not just the U.S. Governments around the world are looking for good sources of innovation. So don't overlook that as a possible funding source. So, so John, as you and I were talking in the commercial break uh, about advice that you could give the listeners, one common question I get is around innovation investment. When you think about organizations, and look, you've, you've advised everything from pharmaceuticals to technologies to you know having worked at Bose. What is your philosophy on investment when it comes to innovation and what advice or what things should the listener think about in their own innovation efforts? A great question. And it's often asked. And I would say, unfortunately, real investment is required. We're not talking about extravagance, but uh, in my experience, and it'd be interesting to know uh, what your rule of thumb was at, at HP, was you'd want to spend about 10% of your total R&D budget, a tenth, roughly on doing things that are 
beyond the three-year horizon, mm -hmm. not 10 years, but let's say three to five years. And uh, this uh, allocation or funding is significant, substantial, but most uh, importantly, it is persistent. Right. In other words, it occurs for years and years and years, and you have to have that faith in in the investment that you're making. Right. Uh, what, what, what's your experience on HP or other organizations where you've looked at this? Well, it was interesting when I when I first got to HP, I would call it ninety eight and two, ninety eight percent oh, gosh, the uh -huh. and two percent, and we shifted it to and. Listeners of the show have heard me talking on this, uh, what we call a 70-20-10 model. 70% to the core, 20% to adjacencies. So take an existing product and go after a new market, right? Or come up with a new product for your existing customer, solve an existing problem. And then that 10% is really what we call the new new. Something way out there could be a totally new product, totally new market you don't reach to today. So... Um, and we took it from 98 and 2 to 70, 20, 10. And in the process, we went from losing, well, at that time, HP was losing three and a half, four billion dollars a year to turning it into the largest tech company in the world by that shift. And again, 100% agree with you. You have to be bought into the philosophy and it has to be consistent. You have to walk the talk. You can't be using your R&D spend as a knob to make your quarterly results look good. Absolutely. And I know there's uh, there in your audience, there are smaller companies and even individuals that are trying to innovate. So these rules uh, of thumb might be helpful to you. And, and that is for smaller organizations, I would look uh, to fund on the order of ten to twenty thousand dollars per year of every technical person you have on board, uh, as another way of kind of looking at at investment oh. that you should make in this category. I hadn't thought so, about it, that as a guideline as part of dollars per technical resource. It's just kind of right. A, a keep that seed funding going on for the new ideas. Exactly. And if you do the math, depending on what the salaries are, it's between 5 and 10% of your total spend on product development. It, anyway, it's an easy rule of thumb. And I think something, although it's difficult when you make it, you'll find that, and I'm sure you found this at HP, Phil, that you get incremental benefits oh, along yeah. the road. You don't just get the big home runs occasionally, but you also can tap on that resource for short-term issues. It, it's so. one of those things where I think a lot of organizations just hurt themselves by thinking they're being, they can be super clever on the funding versus focus on hiring really smart people, give them the resources, and then get the heck out of the way. Right, exactly. <laughs> and you mentioned something there, uh, which is focused on people and the notion of focus. And I think one of the big problems, there's a myth that the innovation is can be crowdsourced or, I mean, it, you can get ideas that way, but true innovation is something that really requires focus because that initial seed, well, the aha moment, that's one thing. But to bring it to a practical point, that's something uh, that's totally different. And that's why you need this persistent funding because yep. you really have to understand and you'll have, as we had at Bose, many failures, wrong ends and U-turns that are required. And so focus is, is really important. Another thing is innovation, as we touched on, it's not a team sport. Execution is definitely necessary with large teams. But for small teams, and we're talking about between one and three three people, I think is about the optimum number, at least in product development and consumer electronics in my experience. So focus, small teams, and persistence are really important. And the last thing, Phil, that we talked about, which I think is really important, is the notion of innovation and marketing. So don't just limit yourself to innovations and products. And sometimes these transformational ideas, these 10% that you talk about, really require innovation in more than one vector at the same time. Yeah. And so yeah. don't underfund or underestimate how much a difference a, a change in your distribution or retailing model can have. Yep. Hey, John, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. If people want to follow you, your company, what you're up to, What's the best way for them to find you? Sure, it's our website, www.tcgen.com. It 
stands for technology capital generation. And uh, go to our product development process page to start your journey on innovation and product. Well, development. and you can also find, if you can, I, I actually did track down a copy of, of your book, Innovate Products Faster. So it's out there. You can do the search. And we'll actually have links of all this out uh, at the show notes over at killinnovations.com. So you can hop on over there and uh, we'll have the links you can to uh, John's company, his book, and, uh, and other information about John. John, thanks again. Really appreciate you joining us here on Kill Innovations. Thanks for having me, Phil. Thank you. So as you wrap up today's show, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us here at Killer Innovations. Um, as I've shared in the past, one favor that I would ask is, is if you like the show, give us a review. If you get, your, get this podcast from iTunes or Google or Spotify or iHeart or any of the other sources, just go over there and give us a review. Let us know what you think. Also, drop me an email. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, suggested new topics, uh, guests that you would like to have on the show. And uh, also just let us know what you're up to and how we can help. I would encourage you to hop over to the innovators.community. It's a free community uh, site where it's just people that are interested in the innovation space or people with new ideas and products wanting and looking for help or advice from uh, a wide range of uh, innovators. So the innovators.community, check that out. And with that, we'll talk to you next week. See you soon. Bye-bye.